I welcome everybody to the triple bottom line presentation, the project that we uh, have completed over the last four months. Uh, to summarize up what we have done, we have identified ESG metrics uh, that were available in the market, and we provide recommendations how to use those ESG metrics, especially for compensation. On top of that, we found ideas and recommendations how you can, you, you can improve your ESG reporting. How, how did we develop the 3BL uh, framework, the, the triple bottom line framework? Uh, we have identified, we have worked with 1,200 metrics that we found uh, from different uh, places where ESG reporting is used, and we categorized them in uh, we, we selected 170 unique metrics that we believe are important, and we categorized them in 33 different categories so that you can easily find the metrics that are suitable to you. We also categorized them by GRI code so that it maps your existing GRI reporting. And we provide the summary of uh, this long list of metrics to you, as well as uh, guidance, a documentation, how you can use that in practice. What have we learned? Um, doing that project. One thing that was really interesting was that most ESG metrics are long-term profit relevant. So we're not talking really about doing good. We are talking about doing well. This is not you know, the typical trade-off between what shareholders want and what other stakeholders want. Most ESG metrics that are used in the market today are long-term profit relevant. We also found it is a lot more than just quantitative metrics, a lot more than just numeric levels. You know, you can be better or worse. There are also metrics that just capture effort and how well you do something. We've then seen that most companies in the market focus on only a very few uh, number of metrics. It's very spotty what we do. And one of the, the things that we realized is that there is a lot more to do. Um, the opportunity is to actually uh, boost long-term value in the company. If you add ESG metrics to your existing incentive framework or uh, corporate performance reporting framework, you will actually have metrics that help you do better in the future. The opportunity is to reward people for that so that your managers are better motivated for a broader set of criteria. And we believe by doing that, you will reduce risk in the company. So adding ESG is really something that adds value to your shareholders and re reduces the risk for yourself. <clears throat> We've also developed a triple bottom line uh, presentation that we believe makes it a lot more intuitive to communicate your ESG performance. The result is basically standards are missing. Uh, standards are not missing. We have a lot of standards. What is missing is consolidation of ESG performance. And that's the purpose of this project. So why do companies need their own ESG framework? You know, you could go there and say like, oh, I just picked the ratings from all these different organizations that you see here. And we select those metrics, we use those metrics to assess our own performance and we'll be fine. The problem with this is, is that these organizations out there have very different objectives. Most of those organizations are founded on specific messages specific missions, you know, some like the CDP, the carbon, uh, the carbon uh, disclosure project, uh, and the TCFD, the carbon uh, related, uh, the, uh, the task force for carbon related financial disclosure, focus on environment. Other like B Corp focuses on social issues. And, you know, the one is probably most in your neck, ISS focuses on governance. So we have organizations that publish ESG ratings that have very, very different agendas, which means, first of all, they cannot agree on your ESG rating. And second of all, you will probably have a different opinion about how to prioritize your own ESG performance. I've done a class at the University of St. Gallen where I asked the students how they rate certain ESG aspects. And we could not agree on one single uh, set of priorities. There were always differing opinions. So the hope that ESG ratings agencies will at one point come together and have the same opinion what is important is 
completely useless, completely, uh, this hope will not materialize. And for these reasons, you have to do your own ESG reporting because you have to reflect your own priorities and not those of the rating agencies. On top of that, it's not just the rating agencies and the government regulators that are interested in your ESG performance. It's also your customers, your employees, and even your investors will make their own ESG assessment. And this is the reason why we need a standard for you, why corporations, issuers on the public markets need their own standard to communicate their own values. And this is what the Obermott Triple Bottom Line ESG framework helps you to do. With that, I come to the, <laughs> the most uh, sensitive question that we have received. There is a lot of talk now about social impact value. And companies are faced with the question, should they value their impact that they have on the environment and the society? An example for impact valuation is, for instance, a nonprofit organization that provides training for refugees. These refugees then with their training can get a job and they get off welfare. It's a clear financial benefit to society. And because these nonprofit organizations that provide that training do not receive that benefit, they basically calculate the impact value that they have on society in order to get funding. For this reason, uh, impact valuation has become really big with philanthrop philanthropic organizations and also something that profit-oriented organizations have been thinking about. It's actually really much in fashion. There's the Value Balancing Alliance uh, from companies like BASF, BMW, Holzim, the Integrated Reporting Council and the SASB, the Standard Accounting uh, Standard Boards, have renamed themselves to the Value Reporting Foundation. So basically, there's a lot of hype right now on uh, value uh, impact valuation. And we got the question uh, from one of the participants if they should not use impact valuation to do that. We believe not, and I'll make the case here why we believe this is a wrong path for profit-oriented companies. I use an example to illustrate that. The example is Roche versus Lanza, which we have connect, which we have selected because they're not yet part of the triple bottom line concept. But uh, also your companies, uh, some of your companies like Holtzim is experimenting with, with impact valuation. And I think that's recommendable because other that's, uh, I, I highly appreciate that, that Holtzim does that. But it's also from Holtzim that I learned that it is very, very difficult. But let's start with a simple example, Roche versus Lonza. Wages is one of the impacts that you have on societies. And companies doing impact valuation have uh, used the number, the amount of salaries that they pay to employees as a part of their positive impact on society. Now, when we compare Roche and Lonza, both in the life sciences industry, Roche pays 16 billion in Beijing and Lonza pays 1.6 billion, only a tenth. Now, when you look at this, obviously you realize you cannot compare these numbers. You know, I mean. First of all, Roche is a lot bigger. And second of all, it doesn't really account for how many employees they have. They also doesn't account for CEO pay levels and country differences. So you may want to evaluate their impact value for wages by using standardization methods, by for instance, dividing the wages by revenue. And then you see Roche and Lonza both pay the same amount of the same share, 28, 27% of uh, their revenues in salaries. So you could come to the solution, they're actually just as good. But of course, revenue is only one way to look at it. You could also look at profits. How much profit is distributed from these two companies? And then you see Roche only distributes 84% of their profits to shareholders, to employees, to employees, <laughs> a new stakeholder that comes in. And Lonza is a lot more generous. They, they pay double, uh, double of what Roche pays to their employees, 160%. Now, looking at this, you would come to the conclusion Lonza is better than Roche. It's a lot more generous. You know, their, their, their profit is shared a lot more with employees. But then when you look at the number of employees, it changes again. The average salary for Roche is 158,000 per employee while the average salary for Lonza is 114,000. 
So now Rosh again is more generous. But that again is not a good number because it doesn't say what kind of employees you have engaged. Maybe Rosh has a lot more highly paid scientists and maybe Lonza is more operational. We don't know. And an outside fewer cannot know. Another impact value that is used is taxes. Roche pays 2.9 billion in taxes, quite nice actually for me as a Swiss citizen. And Lonza only pays 71 million. Now, does that mean Roche is a, makes a lot bigger contribution to society? It isn't, because it could be that Lonza is, just happens to be operating in lower tax region than Roche is. So this is only one way to look at it. Another way to look at it, what do you do with really difficult areas? What do you do with accidents? Uh, Holzin that I mentioned before has stated in their report, in their impact valuation report, that accidents just cannot be valued. You cannot put a value on somebody dying. And then, you know, if you would do, like ethical committees do, do in the medical profession, you become uh, quite easily um, the target of objection. So there's a lot in, uh, in, impact, in impact valuation for profit organizations that provides uh, areas of attack for you. Finally, I've not even mentioned, you know, companies that have a huge social impact, Google and Facebook, for instance, uh, where you would find it completely uh, strange if they would say, uh, if like Google would value uh, the benefits of search people have, you know, and put a number on that, you would say like, that's crazy, or Facebook or Amazon, even worse. Amazon providing goods a lot cheaper to, to customers if they would put a value on what they do there, you would say like, this is crazy, this is just a new technology and they happen to be the platform. So no wonder ESG rating agencies do not use impact valuations. And I recommend for profit organizations not to use impact valuations, but do the same that rating agencies do as well, namely to, to um, rate their performance. I think one of the pieces of feedback or one of the questions that we were getting as we were going through the project is how many metrics should I include in compensation and reporting? How many ESG metrics is the, what is the right number? Uh, and Herman mentioned earlier, as we were doing our review and we've seen uh, in discussions with companies and also looking at, uh, you know, going through some of the annual reports and such that a lot of companies really focus on very few metrics. So they cherry pick a few of the key metrics to focus on. Uh, and this is something that we see as, as, as quite common. Uh, and that was one of the questions that we wanted to address, because, of course, while companies are focusing on just a few, we actually think that there's a potential to include many more ESG metrics when it comes to reporting and also from a compensation perspective. Uh, so if we go on to the next slide, Herman, uh, what we've done is, as Herman mentioned, we did um, review more than 1,200 different metrics, and we've tried to categorize them to make it easier also for you to navigate this ESG framework. Uh, what we see is that, you know, we've put them into 33 different categories representing the environmental, social, and governance uh, areas. And what we've done here is we've illustrated the 33 categories and tried to give them, from our point of view, just a rough weighting in terms of how relevant uh, or how topical the different top categories are um, <clears throat> from what we've seen. And you can see that emissions is one of the biggest areas. So right now, <clears throat> excuse me, climate change is, is a very hot topic. Uh, carbon emissions and emissions, greenhouse gas emissions in general um, is, is probably the biggest topic um, amongst the 33. Uh, obviously energy is, uh, is, is also a very important one. We see employee needs and employee needs is a very broad topic um, because this can include anything from health and safety and health we also have as a separate topic, not necessarily employee related, uh, but more general health, but employee needs covers quite a, a, a wide spectrum. Um, and then we have things like compensation, health, uh, inclusion obviously is a very is a very hot topic at the moment uh, now as well. So you see that there's there's a really wide space out there. Some topics are getting more attention than others, not because they're necessarily more important from one perspective or another, but uh, this is just representing what we see as uh, kind of the, where the focus is uh, from investors, shareholders, and the companies are placing their emphasis on. 
when we go to the next slide, you know, we see that uh, a lot of times people say ESG. Well, there's a sense that if I'm uh, focusing on these ESG criteria, I'm going to need to sacrifice uh, some of it. It's going to cost me. There's going to be a lot of investment. It's, it's a costly exercise. It's detracting me from my core business. And this is what we hear from some, from some companies, not all. Uh, but when you really look at these different categories, you can see that really the most of them do have an impact on your long-term profit. So, uh, you know, emissions, energy, resources, recycling, uh, climate, um, and then all of the different, many of the different social factors. When you look at this, you know, we say that a lot of these categories are going to have an impact on the long-term profit of your business, the long-term success of your business. Moving to a more responsible business is going to help position you for the future, both from a risk management perspective of making sure that you are protected from uh, of certain risks, um, particularly in the governance area, uh, but not only, <clears throat> but also in terms of growth. So there's really an opportunity for growth by moving into some of these new areas and, and positioning your business for really for long-term growth. So I think this was something that was important for us to call out in terms of, you know, really looking at uh, this whole space uh, of, of ESG. There's more of a focus on certain topics than others. Really, the, the bulk of them are um, profit relevant and will help to position you for, um, for, for long term business success. Um, when we look at the compensation and how companies are building certain metrics into their compensation plans, we see that really the focus goes even closer onto very few metrics. So while the priorities are many, the opportunity is, is many, there is a lot of focus and that's not necessarily a bad thing. In the beginning, you really need to focus on certain topics and it's hard to manage a company by, by trying to do everything at once. Um, but what we see is that companies are really focusing on very few metrics. So we've pulled out a few examples. Um, we take a look at Siemens, for example, and the metrics that they've included in their compensation plans are related to carbon emissions, uh, net promoter score. So very much, you know, how, how does the company rate when it comes to perception amongst clients, customers, um, their, uh, their, their broader, that broader target audience, and then also training hours. So there's, there is an emissions um, component, there's a customer component, and there's an employee component. Um, if we look at ABB, ABB is really focused only on safety. So from an ESG perspective, the metrics that they've included in their compensation are really focused on safety metrics only. Uh, if we look at Credit Suisse, they've actually gone a bit broader in terms of uh, customer focus uh, and employee focus, so talent management and diversity, and then very much of a governance focus when it comes to risk and regulatory uh, metrics, as well as conduct and ethics. So this is of the companies that we uh, just show here, which is really just a, a sample of some of these top Swiss companies. Um, they actually have the most metrics included, and these are covering five areas. And if we look at uh, Roche, uh, not that we're trying to pick on them in this presentation, uh, but this was one of the companies that was uh, very transparent in their, um, in, in their compensation. We see uh, environmental uh, metrics as well as diversity metrics. So again, very focused on uh, the environment and diversity, which is very topical amongst in investors and, uh, and their stakeholders, not necessarily uh, aligned with their company strategy, um, but the two topics that they've picked out to include in, uh, in their ESG compensation. And lastly, we included Swisscom uh, in this very brief analysis to, just to show you know they really focus on one metric, which is net promoter score. Um, and I think our message here is, you know, there's a few things. One is that uh, there are so many metrics out there. And even though now on this graph, we've uh, shown where they appear in the different topics, they, they are only covering still one aspect. So when we look at emissions, this may not, you know, even though that's included in the compensation plan, uh, it may not uncover all kinds of emissions, even within emissions, we have a number of different metrics that you could be looking at. Um, so just because a topic is covered doesn't mean that that topic is ticked off um, in its entirety. It's really just one aspect of that topic that's being included. So I think that's one point. The second one is that the, 
metrics that have been included don't necessarily reflect the company's strategic priorities. So the metrics that have been selected, uh, and obviously there are a few different aspects that go into the selection of the metric, but I think very much uh, we see that they are being driven primarily by pressure from uh, investors and shareholders to focus on uh, really these topical issues. We see an opportunity to uh, closer align them with a company's strategic priorities and really include a bit of a broader reporting to tell a broader story uh, also to these investors and shareholders. Um, and I think the last one is that, you know, at the moment, climate and diversity is very topical. These priorities may change over time. And the more metrics you include aligned to your priorities, I think the better positioned you are to also respond to future interest and future um, uh, uh, topics that may become uh, more relevant. Um, so I think just at a very high level, we see that really companies are focusing on just a very few. They're cherry picking these few metrics for valid reasons, uh, but we do see very much an opportunity to broaden this out. And we have a few different ways that we th uh, think that companies can do this. As we've seen that companies are focusing on few topics, we also see that they're really pr focusing primarily on what we've called values or let's say uh, numeric values uh, or, or levels. So it's very much a performance related approach to how much have they, um, uh, when it comes to emissions, how, what is the level of emissions that they have, um, that they have reached? And when it comes to energy, for example, what is that level of energy efficiency? It's very focused on numerical values and the performance of what they've achieved. And we think that there is a broader way of looking at ESG um, effort and performance uh, than only looking at the numerical values achieved. So what we've listed here are some of the actual metrics that we've seen included in compensation systems. Um, but when we look at the metrics that we've reviewed as part of this ESG framework, there are really so many other types of metrics. So we've, uh, we've talked about these 1200 metrics that we've gone through uh, as part of this review. And when we look at the number that actually fall into these numerical values, it's less than half. Uh, so it's, you know, of the 1200, less than 500, which fall into this category of value. The rest are what we've put into now create categories that we've created called policy or strategy, programs, initiatives, reporting and audit. So really when a company is looking to implement ESG in their company, you really start with, you know, the policy the strategy. Um, so really, defining that, uh, identifying that priority as a strategy, creating a policy or programs or initiatives, whatever it may be in that particular company, you implement the plan and then you come to a performance value, you report it, uh, and maybe there's also some auditing. Um, so I think that, you know, when we look at values only, we're really limiting ourselves uh, to really the performance that a company has achieved but where that stands in relation to their broader program, they may be in the beginning of implementing a priority where maybe assessing the effort going into developing a policy or strategy may be, may be more relevant than the actual value achieved. If a company is further along in the process, then the value that they achieved should actually be a bit stronger. Um, you wanna make sure that that reporting is, is a thorough, frequent uh, and audited. And so we see that, uh, you know, for companies that are further along in its particular ESG priority, that then there are other areas that could be included. And the, uh, these are areas that are uh, also being evaluated by the rating agencies and other providers. So they're looking not only at the actual values, but actually much broader. And I think that much broader picture is uh, one that focuses more on, uh, you know, that overall effort of a company. And so how can we assess the ESG priorities and effort that a company is putting in uh, beyond just looking at the actual numerical values uh, or performance that's been achieved. And we see this opportunity really in two areas. One is by including more metric types. So as I've said, we see this range from policy to audit um, as uh, metrics that you can include. And the other is then to go deeper. So going beyond the topics of let's say emissions or diversity, but really including more of those ESG topics um, that are aligned to your company's strategic priorities uh, and also those topics where you 
um, are active and can communicate uh, in ESG performance. I heard uh, from many participants, whenever we, uh, we make recommendations on what to do in compensation systems, we hear that they only want to pick a few metrics because otherwise it gets too complicated and intransparent. If you have decided that many ESG metrics are better because it gives you more opportunity to motivate your employees doing the right thing for longer term profit than just this year, we have developed a solution for you how to um, actually accommodate more metrics than just uh, one to three, as we have seen in practical examples today in Switzerland. First, we need to remember Profit isn't a single metric either. A lot of people looking at ESG compensation now say like, yeah, but on the financial side, we have profit. And you know, we want to have one metric for the ESG side as well. But profit is not a single metric. It's actually a consolidated metric. You know? And you can see here what flows into profit. You know, it's marketing aspects, it's R&T, it's production, it's administration. There's a lot flowing into profit, which means a lot of people are actually affected by the profit metric at the end. Marketing people need to efficiently communicate the product. The production people need to effectively produce it. And the R&T uh, department needs to be as commercially innovative as possible. So when we look at financial, the financial side, where only two or three metrics are used, these are consolidated metrics. And the case we're making here is do the same for ESG metrics. Strive for what, something that we have put here on the right side with all the acronyms that are used today to, um, to display a uh, more sustainable or even, a, even just more long-term performance measurement. Try to consolidate these metrics. And our triple bottom line approach is, is really a method how you can consolidate that. And this gives you a couple of advantages with the overall triple bottom line uh, metrics. It, it, it actually enables you to use non-financial metrics, which are now called ESG, but they could just as well be called balanced scorecard, uh, or they could be called qualitative metrics. It enables you to actually add these metrics to your performance management system. And it helps you consolidate all these diverse metrics into a common denominator, a little bit similar like corporate profit. And we believe you benefit if you use a triple bottom line statement uh, uh, using the open mod approach with a, a lot more divers diversification in how you look at your performance. And that means less risk. It also means, and maybe that's quickly forgotten, if you just use one metric like accident rates, you, you only address the people in your production process. If you use more metrics, you can address a much bigger audience of your employees. Much more people are then affected by increasing your overall ESG performance. And finally, you also have a much better narrative with shareholders because they know it's not about cherry picking, it's about the future, about long-term profits. And that makes you probably wonder, how can we consolidate? How can we consolidate our more ESG aspects into something easy and transparent? And we encountered quite a few problems. When you consolidate multiple objectives, you know, you don't even have to go through the, the list here. I'm gonna go through each one of those uh, aspects later on. You'll have different objectives, volatility, different time horizons, and you need to bring them all together into one metric. So when I list the problem, the first problem we have is a long-term time horizon. If you want to go to net zero carbon by 2030, you know, and you're in 2020, it's 10 years away. Uh, we also have the problem that maybe uh, your target is below the maximum. What do you do if, um, uh, how do you how, what do you do if, um, if you have a target that is below 50% women in management, for instance? How do you accommodate that? And then uh, even worse, if you have a target, let's say you want to be, want to use 100% renewable energy, you know, and you make that into a, a performance assessment that is used in compensation, you basically can only be below target. You cannot exceed the 100%. What should we do with that? I mean, is it fair to your employees and to your shareholders to say, uh, you know, we are at 90% now because you just happened to use a little bit non-renewable energy that year. And, and then there is also 
a question about the upside beyond the target. You know, this is the other problem. Let's say you want to have 20% 20 uh, 20 recycled raw material. Well, if that is 100% of target achievement, if you have 40% recycled raw material, you're at 200% of target achievement. And since you will stay probably there because you have changed your production and your sourcing process, you will have 200% as your, as your ESG achievement, which is just not sensible. Then we have the problem of volatility because you know for each tar for each target that you have you have to set a minimum a threshold a maximum performance and if you have a lot of volatility you may end up being maximum or minimum you know uh, in in oscillating years you know like you know one year is it's everything and then it's nothing and what do we do with volatility what do we do with line of sight what do we do with timing you know if we have here on the right side uh, you want to go from 1,000 emission to zero emission in 2030, 100,000 to zero in 2030. That may actually go very quickly at the beginning and then slowly at the end, or vice versa. It may go very slow at the beginning and very uh, quickly at the end. So what do we do with the timing? So there are lots of questions, and we provided one solution that we believe covers this all. And i like to explain that solution. It starts with differentiating between targets and milestones. And uh, targets for us are things that are further down in the future. These are the targets that you want to reach eventually. And milestones are what you do on the way there. So this, at this moment, sounds quite simple. But to be honest, the, the, the simpler it is, the better, actually. And we believe with this differentiation, you actually have something that solves a lot of the problems we, we mentioned today. So examples I've listed here, you can read that. And, and the solution would be, if we have a short-term milestone achievement and we surpass that, that takes precedence over the long-term target, which means at the beginning of your process, when you still have 10 years ahead of you and you're actually making a lot of progress, that should actually be your performance. While when you finally end, you know, and you finally are at the end of you and you're close to your target, and when maybe your milestone is not achieved, but you're very close to target, then the target should take precedence. So we have a simple rule which basically says target achievement is the floor, and milestone achievement is your upside for your manager. And that now needs a, a couple of more things to think about. It's a little bit complicated, I know, at this moment. The good thing is. You only have to do it once at the beginning of the design and will work forever, for a long time at least. Um, when we look at targets, we have to think about uh, the scale. You know, let's say the target can go from zero to 100%, let's say 100% recycling. Then uh, you have to think uh, first that um, how high can a target achievement go? Because you would expect that above target is quite difficult. We recommend that targets have an up to 120% scale, 120% of target. That can also work for um, diversity, like uh, here on the right side, if you have women managers, for instance, your target may be 30% women because that's already difficult. But obviously, if you go all the way up to 50%, that's still good. But then at the end, you may actually at one point be discriminatory against men, and it should actually, the performance should actually go back down again. So it can work for all types of metric and metrics. And for each target, you will have to set a one to 120% scale. This is the one part of the, the second part of the solution. And since managers are not so motivated by just being able to reach 120%, you have to have a higher achievement scale for your milestones. And the typical way of using uh, performance assessments for compensation is you go between zero to two times your target. So we believe an up to 200% scale is, is useful for milestones. What is important here is uh, no matter what scale you have here on the horizontal axis, be it tons, percentages, percent surpassed peers, million, millions of wages, whatever your target is, it has to be converted with a function like you see here from a 0% achievement to a 200% achievement. And if I summarize now all that that I have said, it's three things. You have to scale all your targets and milestones where 
in a way that 100% means achieved. You do this for all ESG metrics that you prioritize, your company prioritizes, not others. You, your priorities count here. And the third point is, while long-term target achievement is still far away into the future, short-term milestone achievement has precedence. In other words, short-term performance cannot fall below long-term target achievement. We can also call it a performance floor. This is the technical term in compensation. The rules presented here are applicable to all 170 ESG metrics that we have, and we are conf confident that they will also apply to any future metrics that we'll find over the course of the next couple of years when we continue this ESG panel. So we believe we have now a system where you can assess each metric individually and then consolidate it towards an overall achievement. Um, our triple bottom line. Um, this actually hasn't changed from what we presented last year, despite uh, last uh, in June, despite the feedback. We propose an inverse waterfall chart where each ESG aspect has is a separate selection that you do as a company. And each aspect has the weight that you assign uh, this bar. So that at the end of the day, uh, to the left of the, to the right of the chart, you see an orange bar with your cumulated ESG performance. So what we are recommending not to do, we advise against an ABC rating that the rating agencies use because we believe this is a lot less uh, easy to understand than a scale from zero to 100% to maybe 200%. How do we get to this chart? It all starts with your unweighted ESG performance uh, in a, that, you, that can be represented in a bar chart. Uh, what you see here is, a, is that actual client where we implemented uh, uh, an ESG performance uh, method. And this client has selected carbon, innovation, gender, materials, and water as their important aspects in their ESG strategy. And e for each of those aspects, we have used uh, these functions that I, that I showed you before and assessed how well they did in that year, in, in the year 20, uh, 20, uh, 2020, 2020, yeah, last year. So what you see here, they completely outperformed their carbon target. They were at 200% target achievement. On the innovation side, they just matched their target. So they have a value of 100%. Gender is an outperformance. Was, by the way, two metrics that flew into gender. Materials, they wanted to use um, biodegradable materials, uh, was an underperformance in that year. And water was an outperformance. They wanted to use less water. So the result of that, if you look at all these bars, the average of those bars is the company overall ESG performance. And it can be calculated quite easily because these are all percentage values. And the result, again, is a percentage value. So it's really just a simple average of the first five bars. Now, this we recommend to turn into the waterfall chart because the water waterfall chart can accommodate different weightings. This company has chosen to weight everything the same. So the result, the orange bar is the same because it's, it's the same weighting, it's just another representation that uh, is more intuitive to understand, especially if there are weightings applied because you cannot see the weightings on the left side, but on the right side, if carbon would have a higher weight, maybe double the weight than the others, it would now be higher. And because carbon was an outperformance, the orange bar would be higher too. Now we presented this chart last uh, time and we got feedback. And you know, one feedback was that they didn't like so much that all values are positive. All contributions to overall uh, company performance are positive. Certainly some have to be negative. And we can do that by um, calculating the performance as a difference to the mean, to the, to the target. So this would be positive performances and materials would be a negative performance uh, because it goes down, it's not, the target is not achieved. And if you do the waterfall chart this way, it's what you have on the left side. Now, everything is counted from the median and aspects that are positive go up and aspects that are negative go down. And the result would be a difference to the median. Uh, 
which you see here on the left chart. And on the right chart, you see a, a bar that just goes all the way down to zero, which again is the same bar as before. So we are using a different representation that is a little bit more aligned with, your mark with our marketing material that has positive and negative values in it. So you would actually be able to show that materials is a below target achievement. Now, because uh, these contributions are smaller, it's quite squeezed together. And one way of solving the squeezing problem is you scale it. And what you see on the lower left uh, chart, you see uh, something stretched. You know, now the scale only goes from 50% to 150%. And now the contributions of each aspect are bigger. But this doesn't solve one problem, uh, which uh, is here quite obvious, and that's innovation is at target. And because it's at target, it's neither positive nor negative. It's, it's just 100%. It, it is the difference to 100% and is zero. It's not visible. So using that chart for exactly the same as before uh, would yield in the necessity of having to stretch the chart and being unable to see innovation as a contribution. And for this reason, we don't recommend this version. Now we're coming to the most important part, uh, which is converting ESG performance into ESG compensation. And by using everything that we've discussed so far, that this last step is kindergarten. It's really easy. What we have here on the left side is the chart that we showed you before, where everything is scaled from 0% to 200%. And the only thing we have to do to convert that in a, into a compensation is by uh, changing the scale on the vertical axis. It doesn't go from 0% to 200%. It goes from zero times bonus to one times bonus to two times bonus, target bonus. So the only thing we have to do is really change the scale uh, to make that easier to understand and 144% ESG achievement which was the result for this company on the left side, turns into 1.44 times target compensation. Looking at this uh, consolidated ESG performance representation makes ESG compensation really easy. We recommend it because people without financial background can understand it, no matter what metrics you use. Even if they have no idea about the HR side or the production side, they still understand what a 150% achievement of a certain metric is. It actually has built-in caps, targets, and floors, and that's important for compensation. In compensation, you always want to have a floor and a cap. Uh, uncapped compensation uh, is being frowned upon. Only, and finally, it can be used for internal management and leadership, as well as communicating to external parties. This is also really good. It's not confidential. It doesn't reveal your targets. It just reveals how you assess the performance of your targets, and you can decide yourself how transparent you want to be about your targets. Great. Thank you, Herman. So I think uh, that was quite a lot that we focus now on the, the feedback and what we heard, which I think was a very valuable part of the, the, the process. Uh, now I'm going to go a little bit into the nuts and bolts um, and how we can how you can actually use the framework. So if we go on to the next slide, this is one that you may have uh, see, you've seen before. You may recall from earlier presentations, which really just outlines the objectives and the approach that we took with this. So you know we really looked at the key metrics um, that we wanted to recommend for you for a compensation and reporting. Uh, and then obviously we've talked a lot about how to consolidate and how to build them into compensation. Um, the idea here is not, you know, we've come from this big universe of about 1200 metrics. We've tried to create, the, create a, a framework um, that's a little bit easier for you to navigate. So we've categorized these according to the type of metric. So, you know, is it an absolute value, uh, a, a quantifiable numerical value, which is what companies tend to focus on, or is it related to a broader effort that a company could be putting into? And I think this is where we see, like I said, a lot of the opportunity, uh, because this is where also agent rating agencies and, uh, you know, organizations are focusing, um, uh, are, are looking and building their 
their assessment of, of companies uh, as well. So, uh, you know, whether it's an implementation of a policy or, you know, frequency and transparency and reporting, et cetera, these are all things that are also valued. So we wanted to call those out for you. And those are certainly included in this uh, short list then of metrics that we recommend. So out of this 1200, we've really tried to narrow down into 170 unique metrics that we think could be relevant from a reporting and a compensation perspective. And we've put the categorized them, like I said, according to the type of metric, as well as to the topic, uh, the, so thematically, uh, if they belong to EES or G um, in, a, in a kind of a more granular category. We've also assigned GRI codes to all of them so that when you come to, when it comes to your GRI reporting, you can make sure that they are, you know, you're being uh, as thorough as, as possible and you know which categories they fall into. Um, so for these 170, like I said, it's really, the intention is not that all 170 should be included in your reporting and your compensation. Obviously, depending on your company, on your um, strategic priorities, on your ESG priorities, you will then pull from this pool of 170 um, to, to select the ones that are most relevant for your company. What we try to do is really narrow down to a short list uh, to make it a little bit easier for you to navigate. Um, like I said, for your compensation, but also for your reporting. We believe that if you have more thorough reporting, more comprehensive reporting, then obviously there's a, a broader story that you can tell to investors, to shareholders, and also to be more thorough uh, with the rating agencies. So that's just a little bit of a reminder of what uh, what we what we've put together for you, and we will be delivering this uh, to the to the panel participants as a as an Excel sheet that you can then uh, search and more easily navigate. And then obviously there's a documentation that we have that goes along with it. If we go on to the next slide, uh, really just um, some top level uh, approach uh, from our side of how you can how you can work with this so uh, with this framework so when you come to define your priorities you know one area that you could look to is uh, to the SASB materiality so depending on your industry and your sector you can see the ESG topics that are most relevant uh, to be covered off uh, and that will already help you filter from the 170 down to a, a more narrow category that's relevant to your industry. Uh, and then from that, you know, really looking at the actual metrics that you might want to include. include. So for each materiality, selecting the relevant metrics from that list based on, you know, the years where you want to place your effort um, and focus in the beginning. And from a purely pragmatic point of view, it may be driven by uh, not only your industry, where you are, uh, you know, the, the topic that's most relevant for your business, but also where do you have data? that's currently available? Where can you actually have numbers to put behind the metrics? Uh, and this may be you know, a, a phased process. There may be those uh, low hanging fruit where you currently have the data and you can easily report on a certain metric. Uh, and then, you, But you may also need to identify some areas where you may not have the numbers um, and to, you need to establish some processes and some will be easier to establish than others. So this is also sort of this prioritization that you can um, uh, use in selecting the metrics to include uh, really from a pragmatic side, you know, how, how easily um, uh, can you report on certain metrics? Uh, and then the third question, uh, you know, here it's just one simple line item, but certainly not a very easy thing to do uh, is really setting those target levels. So, so, so new to your point, um, that is a very uh, important part of the process. Uh, we certainly uh, speak with you about your company, but then also I think there's certainly a pool of expertise from the panel uh, to, to draw on when it comes to actually setting the actual target levels. Uh, and then when it comes to the reporting, you know, what are those consolidation rules here? Uh, you know, Herman has covered off a few of them that we've, uh, that we've summarized in this presentation and we'll share with you in the documentation. Uh, but, uh, you know, this is where it all kind of comes together for your reporting uh, or, or your compensation. Uh, and which is the last point is to build that into the compensation plans. So just a very rough kind of process uh, uh, in way to use uh, the framework uh, and we have sort of guidance um, at each of the steps from our side. And then, like I said, also from the panel for some broader uh, experience across the group, right? So uh, I guess, you know, the, these last uh, four or five months have been very valuable for us and hopefully for you too. 
Uh, we've learned a lot about not only the, the landscape of metrics out there, the priorities that rating agencies and organizations are looking at, um, but I think we've also been able to gather a lot of uh, experience and know-how in, in working together with you, and we'd like to continue with this panel uh, going forward. So, um, you know, into next year and two years to come. So this in, initial project is, is wrapping up. Um, we're looking at a Q&A session in November, uh, as Herman said, but we'd really like to continue it. And to, in continuing this panel, there are a few things that we would certainly include in it. One is updates to the framework. So as uh, metrics, uh, new metrics come in place, uh, you know, we would keep that uh, metric um, framework up to date and share that with, with the panel. Uh, like we said, there's that direct contact to Obermott, what we call the, the help desk for really specific uh, inquiries related to, you know, how to measure, how to implement, how to consolidate. That's something that we're, uh, where we're certainly available to support uh, at an individual level. As you can see in this presentation, we can speak very broadly, um, but obviously there's a lot that's specific to your company and we're able to, uh, to discuss that with you on a one-on-one -on -one, um, basis. Uh, we'd also, you know, as with this round, uh, make the email contacts of everyone available to each other so that you can also reach out to other um, participants directly. Uh, and, you know, the, we would also look to lead some informal networking events. So, for instance, in November, when we have the Q&A you know, situation permitting, we could have kind of an informal networking event, uh, you know. Hopefully at one point, it'd be nice to meet everyone, not just virtually through Zoom, uh, but somehow face-to-face. -face. Um, so that's something that we would certainly strive towards uh, once that's possible. And then we would have another annual event to really discuss trends as they're evolving in this, in this space and to discuss and to resolve any uh, challenges or issues um, that you're facing. And that's maybe coming from experience that we have, but also drawing on the expertise and experience from from the panel and your, your peers. The, the benefits, you know, uh, really keeping abreast of the, it's a, it's a fast moving field. So keeping abreast of really those, the metrics, the priorities, the recent developments in this space. Uh, you know, as we looked at all of these different metrics, what we see is that really their standards are not uh, in place yet. So there's a lot of movement uh, when it comes to rating agencies, organizations, you know, um, each having different priorities. So really keeping abreast of that uh, and really, I think, drawing on, <clears throat> excuse me, the expertise uh, and experience of the, of the peers. If you want to add something, maybe from my side, what's coming next is that you, that the participants, the panel participants will um, uh, receive the, the final long list of ESG metrics with all the uh, categories and uh, GRI codes and they will receive a documentation on um, uh, how to use these metrics. And everybody who has actually joined us today will receive the presentation. And we'll also cut the presentation uh, into different video uh, snippets that we use that address the topics that we have covered today. So you can go back and just watch a, a short, maybe three to five minute video, and you'll get that answer uh, live answered, question live answered. So this is are the next steps. Uh, if uh, you are part of um, the interested uh, group of people joining today, you can also join uh, the panel, of course, and we will talk to each other about it. So it's a pity we can't uh, have lunch together now as we originally planned. Uh, we regret that, but I guess the situation, not only the situation um, with the pandemic, but also uh, the, the, the sheer efficiency of a, of a Zoom conversation, uh, is the reason why we can't meet. But for, fortunately, you, you opted for an informal get together and we have really good ideas here in Switzerland, what, what you can do uh, when it's informal. We just had our 20th um, anniversary for Obermott last week and uh, we took the whole team, went on the Lake of Zurich and uh, all the way to Rapperswil and then to the two islands. And we had, we had a really good day celebrating that. And who knows, maybe that's, we can do something similar to that. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, you will receive the material that we promised that you can always contact uh, Michelle, Carola, me or Candace directly. If you have any questions, we'll definitely be in touch with you with the results of today's presentation. Bye-bye.